Good morning, good morning. Let's grab a seat. Let's grab a seat. All right. What happened? That's all right. Everybody's surrounded around the water. <laughs> all right, let's um, go over the announcements real brief. Matthew um, is up north in Napa. He might be watching right now. How you doing, brother? But um, he, his grandmother had passed away, uh, and he went and did the memorial yesterday. And so it was in a Catholic church, and he got to preach the gospel, so it was pretty awesome. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. So... Um, he, he will be back next week, okay? So I'm filling in for Matt. Um, so Tuesday nights, we have a prayer meeting, um, obviously at our house and the flyers in the back. I encourage you guys to pray, especially after, t- after today's study. Today's study is entitled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. So um, we're going to be looking at prayer. So I encourage you guys just to come on out on Tuesdays at 7 o'clock, flyers in the back with our address and everything. Grab one and our doors are open to you guys at any time to come and pray, okay? And then uh, we have the um, Women's Breakfast Potluck. That's Saturday, September 14th um, at 9.30. And that's at George and Kathy's home. And so my wife will be teaching the Word. And, and it's, do, it's the whole uh, Flourish you know, Women's Bible Study that she's doing. And then right after that, it's a tamale making. So... Um, actually, today we need to. She needs to go and get the supplies. So um, I think she's going to collect five bucks from everybody if you guys have it to, you know, get the masa and and the meat and stuff like that. And so um, if if you have a special recipe or something, just or whatever, just get with my wife and she'd be more than happy to. She's all ears, okay? Because she's never made tamales, so. So she's all she's kind of relying on Pinterest and the Food Network and you guys, okay? So it'll be good, uh, but it'll be a great time of fellowship for you, ladies. So again, that that goes from so from 9:30 to 4:30. It'll be a full day, right? You guys will spend time in the Word in the morning, just fellowshipping and having breakfast and doing all that, and then hanging out and fellowshipping and making tamales and and all that stuff, okay? And bring a friend, sign up, bring a friend, just. Enjoy the day. And then um, we have a, a really cool opportunity to go and serve at Operation Christmas Child with Samaritan's Purse. Now, the date has just changed. I just got an email yesterday. Um, so it'll be Wednesday, December 18th, which has, I think, 15 spots if we wanted to go as a group. And uh, that's at the processing center in Fullerton. And what you do is you, the kids they have the boxes. So you go and you basically take all the boxes that have been collected from the different churches in the area and get them ready for shipment, and they get sent out all over the world, okay? So if you guys are interested, um, we'll make a sign-up sheet in the back and just kind of, you know, just sign up for that, and it's from 7 to 10. I don't think you have to stay until 10 o'clock, but that's just the time frame that they give us, okay? And then um, if we want to take a smaller group, we also have a reservation for Thursday the 19th, Okay? So um, there's only like eight people that can go there. So I encourage you guys to sign up. This is a this is a really really um, this is the Lord that opened this opportunity because people fill these spots up in August and like within a week or two they're full and you cannot get in. And um, Melissa Shaw was able to get us in there, and so let's take advantage of it. Just go and and just process these things. It's a really neat time to just serve and. And, and get that going. So that's sign up, sign up in the back. And that is that. Today's verse of the week is Isaiah 40, 29, which says this. It says, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. You ever felt weak spiritually? You ever felt like you just can't take it anymore? You just can't go on anymore? The Lord says that he gives strength to you when you're weak and or power when you're weak and strength when you are powerless. 
Bible says that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so um, when we are at the end of ourselves, that's when he reveals his power. Oftentimes we don't see his power because we're in the way too much. <laughs> we're, 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 we, we got too much of self in it. So uh, we need to get out of the way so that we can see God work fully in our lives. Amen? Amen. Awesome. So, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. And while you guys do that, I'm going to ask a very special brother to come up here, one who's very, very special to my life. His name is Randy Gonzalez. Come here, Randy. Come here, Randy. I want you to see something, Randy. And I really mean it. Okay? Just want you to see it. (laughs) Randy had a birthday on December 5th. How old did you turn? Uh, 21. No. <laughs> 39, 39. Oh, man, you're almost there. You're next like year, right next there. Year. <laughs> I'll be 46 this month, just so you know. Anyway. Right, yeah, um, right behind you. <laughs> I love this guy. This guy, has him and his wife have been with us through thick and thin. And so um, I just want to thank the Lord for Randy and pray for him. Okay. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for my brother, Randy, Lord. I love this guy so much, him and his family, his wife, his boys. They're such a blessing, Lord. Um, They've been an incredible blessing to me and Rhonda, Lord. And um, I just thank you for him. I thank you just for his heart, Lord. He's just always just been a great, great friend, a great listener, Lord God. And um, I just thank you for him. I thank you for him and his family just being here at Real Life and being a a big part of this and supporting and serving in children's ministry and doing stuff behind the scenes with the website and all kinds of things. God, Lord, you're just faithful. You're so good. And I just thank you that um, this began in their home. Lord, this work began in their home. And Lord, um, we're excited to see what you're going to do. And so, Father, I just pray blessings upon blessings for my brother and his family. Lord, I ask God that you would just keep him healthy and Continue to give him vision and direction, Lord, for his business. And, Lord, just bless him, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy birthday, bro. Amen. Love you, too. All right. Awesome. Randy's a, you know, you guys that heard my testimony, I'll never forget. This is one of the most powerful things that ever, somebody, that anybody ever did. I don't know if Randy knows this, but. Um, there was a there was a season when we were when I was being restored in my marriage and we were going through all that. Randy lived in the apartments next door to us, and um, in the apartment building next door to us. And uh, I just would go knock on his door. I'm like, "Hey, man, can we go for a walk?" And we go for a walk behind the neighborhood, and I would share things that are so heavy on him, and he wouldn't say a word. We just walk, and then. I remember he told me one time, I'll never forget this. He goes, just sit down. We sat on the curb, and he's like, I'm just going to take you to Jesus. I'm just going to pray. And he just prayed for me. And that was like the most incredible thing to me because he didn't try to lecture me. He didn't try to, you know, give me a whole bunch of scripture. He didn't do any of that. He didn't try to counsel me or anything. He just simply just prayed for me. Because I think at that time, I think the information was just too much. And he said, you know what? I'm just going to take you to Jesus. And that was, I'll never forget those words. I'm going to take you to Jesus. And I think that's the best thing that we can do, right? Is when you're going through something with somebody, or they come to you, and you don't necessarily, you know, well-intended people try and say very nice things when somebody passes away. And it can come off very, you know, hard. There was somebody that, that told, um, I think it was, I think it was my wife, told my wife, um, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I can relate with you. I lost a dog once. That doesn't, what? <laughs> and it's, I understand what they're trying to say, but it doesn't come out that way. And so we just, simply, sometimes it's just okay to just keep quiet and just say, you know, let's just pray. Let's just pray. I'm just going to take you to Jesus. So thank you, bro. I love you, man. Luke chapter 11, last week, this is a new chapter, I should say, uh, so last week we wrapped up chapter 10, and, and in the wrapping up of chapter 10, we looked at the importance of the Word of God and, and, and briefly touched on prayer and discipleship as a whole, and the importance of discipleship as 
believers. And I asked you guys a question, how many of you guys have been personally discipled? And there's only been a few of you. So um, this week I should be finishing up all the corrections and everything. I'll give it to George and we get our discipleship program done. And then hopefully at the beginning of the year, uh, we'll start our discipleship groups and start discipling and growing in the Word. And even if you've been walking with the Lord for a while and you've already been discipled, I encourage you just to go through it again, you know, and, and just refresh yourself in the Word of God and get encouraged in your walk and built up because discipleship is important. It's, it's important. It's false also for raising up leaders within the church rather than going out. It's pouring into you and you catching the vision and you getting excited for the work that God is doing and you just stepping up and say, hey, I'm ready. Okay, good. I'm ready. I've been discipled. I'm, I'm growing. I'm ready to move forward now. I know the Lord is challenging me to go deeper with Him. And so that's, that's always, always a good thing. And so now as we enter into a new chapter in the Gospel of Luke, Luke here in chapter 11 in the first 13 verses that we're going to look at really emphasizes and focuses on prayer. And we get the model of prayer through Jesus. And Jesus gives us this, this beautiful picture of it. And it, we're going to draw some insight into seeing how important prayer is for our life, how important prayer is for our walks. It's a healthy, healthy part of our walks. Acts 2.42 says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the Word of God, in fellowship, tamale parties and women's fellowships and men's fellowships and getting together and going and doing the let love shine outreach and stuff that like that. That's all fellowship, right? Calling each other up. Hey, you want to go get a cup of coffee? Let's get the word. Let's just, let's just meet. Let's, I got some things to share. Hey, you want to go for a walk? I got some heavy stuff I need to share with you. That's fellowship, right? Um, fellowship and in breaking of bread and taking communion. That's what we did last week, right? Once a month, we focus on uh, the cross. We, we do it all the time. The cross is always mentioned in the messages, but we remember the cross. Remember the work of the cross and what Jesus did for us. And it's always, always good to remember the cross and to remember the work of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection that gives us the, the, the death that covers the penalty of our sin and, and, and then the resurrection that gives us victory and new life over our sin. And then lastly, and in prayers. So the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Those are like four legs to a chair for your walk. Every one of, all four of those are a different leg, and every single one of them are vitally important for you to have a, to have a healthy walk with the Lord. If one of those is shaky, just like that chair would be shaky, uh, we back in the day when, when, I, when I'd hang when I was a crazy teenager, young adult, we'd go to pool parties and people would sit in these plastic chairs and I walk by and I just kick the leg, it would break and then they'd fall because I was a jerk. But but that chair was now broken and so to sit on it, you know, it'd be kind of like not safe, right? You're asking for it when you're. When you're walking with the Lord and you have one of these four things that is shaking or two of these four things that is shaky or three of these four things that are shaky, you have a walk that's not solid. You have a shaky walk. And prayer is one of those things that just really helps you to refocus. It's one of those things that, you know, when you start focusing on your problems and not focusing on your God... Prayer allows you to, we'll see that today, prayer allows you and helps you to get back into focus. I was sharing with the three boys, Axel, Kevin, and Angel, yesterday when we were doing this outreach, and I was sharing with them, you guys have heard me say it before, I I told them, I said, you know, uh, we all go through things, and I said, you know, when we share, or or when, when we're facing a problem, a lot of times we like to focus on our big problem, when we tell our God about our big problem. And I say, don't tell God about your big problem. Tell your problem about your big God. And that's refocusing your perspective, right? It's changing things up. And so prayer is the single most important, listen, the single most important privilege 
that the creator of the universe has given us to communicate with him and he with us. And yet prayer is in some people's lives is often neglected or misunderstood. It's the privilege of the child of God. Does God hear the prayers of the non-Christian? Anybody, anybody want to be brave and answer? Does God hear the prayers of the non-Christian? Yes, yes. Why? Because God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to answer their prayers, but he does hear their prayers. He hears the prayers and he answers the prayer of the child of God. So, here in chapter 11, in verse 1, we're gonna, I'm going to read the first 13 verses, and then we're just going to just dive in and, and get through it, okay? So let's read. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And so I thank So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus teaching on prayer. It's interesting to me that in verse 1, Jesus does all these miracles in the previous chapters that we've looked at. We've seen all the things that he's done. But in verse 1, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't ask him, Lord, teach us to walk on water. Hey, Lord, you, you cast out that demon from that kid, man. Teach us how to do that. You ever watch somebody do magic? You go, how would you do that? Man, teach me how to do that. I want to know what is the secret, right? They didn't ask any of that. They didn't ask, Lord, how did you raise Lazarus from the dead? He was dead four days. Remember, he stinketh. You know, when somebody tells you, you stinketh, they add an E-T-H at the end, you smell. You're funky. It's bad, right? Lord, he stinketh by now. But they didn't ask him any of that. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. They could have also said, Lord, teach us to fish. Because <laughs> they weren't really good at it, right? Anytime I read the disciples, they never caught anything. The only time they caught something was when Jesus was with them. And then Jesus would put money in the mouth of the fish. But they never caught anything. They could have asked that. But they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. This is so awesome because... Why do they ask this question? To me, I believe, it's because they understood that as they watched Jesus in his prayer life, listen, it says it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place. Jesus was always praying. The Bible says that Jesus got up early and he went away to pray. 
Remember that? Uh, uh, the Bible also says that Jesus commands us, hey, come away by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while. Come, get away. Seek the Lord. We read in the Psalm, we read in the Psalms last week how we rise up early and seek Him. There's many, many people in many different ways prayed and sought the Lord for many reasons at many different times. And so they got up and they went to seek the Lord. And, and I'm sorry, they got up and they saw Jesus seeking his Father and they were stirred and they saw that this was a habit in his life. They saw that this was something that, that he did continually. And so it stirred their heart And they said, Lord, teach us. Because we notice that when you pray, you have this close connection with the Father. And when you pray and you meet with Him, afterwards, ministry flows from you. Afterwards, God uses you powerfully. Afterwards, you perform many miracles. And it comes from you meeting with your Father. So, Lord, teach us. First thing I want to put out here, pull out of here is this. Ministry flows from intimacy with the Lord. Write that down if you're taking notes. Ministry flows from intimacy. From a bonding, from a closeness with God. Intimacy with the Lord. Ministry just naturally flows out because you learn to talk like him you learn to act like him you learn to think like him you have a heart like him you see the way that he sees ministry flows from intimacy with the lord it's very natural and listen it's very powerful becomes it because it comes from a connection with the father a healthy prayer life is vital to the health of of a believer look at what it says lord teach us all oftentimes here This phrase comes from new believers and from other people. They'll say, um, I don't know how to pray. I I don't know how to pray. I don't know know what to say. I love that someone once said this. It says, prayer is simply talking to God like a friend and should be the easiest thing we do each day. I like that. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It's a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. I love that. A spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. That's what prayer is like. So prayer is something that can be taught, but I believe because people have a Um, misconception of it they feel that they need to be taught when it's as simple as just talking like talking to a friend Andrew Murray said this he says Jesus never taught his disciples I like this this is so cool Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach only how to pray He did not speak much of what was needed to preach well, but much of praying well. To know how to speak to God is more than knowing how to speak to man. Ooh, let me say that again. To know how to speak to God is more than knowing how to speak to man. Not power with men, but power with God is the first thing. Bible says in Proverbs that God holds the hearts of kings in his hands and like the rivers of water, he turns them whichever direction he wants. And so we as people, we go, we go into a meeting or we go and talk to somebody influential or this and that or there's something pressing and we try to muster up specific words, specific phrases. What do I need to say in order to convince them? What do I need to say in order to kind of, you know, um, close the deal or this and that? And, and we need to be concerned with, hey, the hearts of the kings are in the Lord's hands and he can turn it whichever way. So communicate with him and let him have his way. Amen or amen? He does it. When we, when we learn that, when we learn that he's in absolute control of everything, you're, you're liberated from pressure of trying to convince men 
I love that phrase. It's to know how to speak to God more than it is knowing how to speak to man. Now, if Jesus, the perfect Son of God, had to depend on prayer during his life here on earth, then how much more do you and I need to pray? We need to pray. In fact, the true marks of our ministry and dependency upon the Lord are seen in how given we are to prayer. Martin Lord Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones expressed it beautifully in his studies on the Sermon on the Mount. And when he said this, he said, Man at his greatest and highest, when upon his knees, he comes face to face with God. It's in that place of prayer that we see God. We see ourselves in light of him. We see his greatness. We see our weakness. We see his strength. And we see our need. I don't know how a person thinks that they can survive in this world without an established prayer life. We need to be people of prayer. So, Lord, teach us. Amen and amen. Teach us, God, to pray. Teach us to talk with you and commune. By the way, I think that the teaching part of it is not only the how, but learning the importance of why we should pray. First Chronicles 16.11 says, Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Seek His face always. Always. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Always, First Chronicles sixteen eleven. Philippians four six. We all know it, but I'm going to read it to you because it's important. Philippians chapter four, verse six, helps us get a really, really good perspective of prayer and anxiety and things going on in our hearts. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about nothing. Worry can creep up on us quick, can it? Things can happen, and we just, in a second, we just start freaking out. But he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And listen, when the worry creeps in and you do that, you give, you lay your requests with thanksgiving, you make your supplications, the Bible says here, says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The mind is a very powerful thing. The mind wanders off. The mind begins to, you know, think of all these different scenarios and think of all these things, and the mind doesn't... It's like faith doesn't work with the mind. The mind needs facts, right? The mind works with information. God says, I work with faith. And so our mind is, is constantly at battle with our faith. Because we're thinking all these different things. And God says, I want you to think upon me. Look at later, he says here in verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, is there anything, any virtue, is there anything praiseworthy? Meditate on these things. Don't waste your time like a dog chasing his tail, meditating on your problems. Meditate on God and the truth of God. The things that are true, loving, praiseworthy, noble, meditate on that. We just sang it, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That's who we need to focus on. 
That's the character of God in these things. And I understand that it's a lot easier said than done when you're in the midst of it. But that's where our faith is being tested. That's where our faith is being is, uh, fashioned and formed. Those are, those, those are healthy, that's a healthy process. And look at verse 2 of Luke chapter 11. So he said to him, When you pray, say, Our Father... In heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This right here is a model of prayer. This right here is not the mother of all prayers. This isn't the grand pooba. When you're in, oh man, when you're in some big, big trouble, you break out, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. No, that's not what it is. This is not the, 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 the prayer that you pray. This is the model of prayer. This is um, the problem that people have. This, that this is the misconception of this prayer, is that they think that it is the super prayer to pray. It's a great prayer. But Jesus used it as a model. Your Bible actually even says that it's a model for prayer. It's not the super prayer. I wish it would would have said the super prayer. We'd all be praying it all the time, right? But then then our relationship would change. Now it would become very religious, right? We get the lottery numbers. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, it's not going to be. It doesn't work that way, right? No, it would be messed up that way. People read this and they think that this is what I need to do. But I started thinking, why do we pray in certain ways? And where did that come from? And why do we bow our heads? Why do we bow our heads to pray when the Bible says that Jesus prayed looking up into heaven? Why do we pray with our hands clasped. When the Bible says that people prayed with their hands lifted up. Why do we pray before meals? Well, they prayed before meals, but they also prayed after meals. So I'm just demolishing all your views on prayer right now. Right? Why, why, why do we do that? <laughs> Many people have written many, many books on prayer with many methods of how to pray and how to pray effectively. And you hear things, you know, the seven steps to entering into the presence of God, etc. And Pastor John Corson has this little great, this great little book. It's called um, Praying Through the Tabernacle. It's powerful. I encourage you guys to get it. It's a little pamphlet, really. It's really, really cool. Um, but there's all these really great, great Uh, books on how to pray and how to pray effectively, but I personally don't think the issue isn't following the seven steps of entering into the presence of God. I think the issue is really getting people to pray and do what the Bible says to do, which is to pray. If we just simply obey the word and just pray like we're supposed to, our life will be different. Amen? We just get busy and we just don't pray. We just don't pray. Ian e. Bounds is a man who wrote numbers of books on prayers. As a matter of fact, he wrote five volumes on prayer. And check this out. At the end of his life, he said he was unhappy with his prayer life. That is a whole lot of reading to get to where he was. <laughs> unhappy with his prayer life. Sadly. Prayer meetings, though, are often the most smallest and neglected meetings. It's 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 the it's the workhorse of the church. Prayer. Why? Why do people neglect prayer meetings? Who knows? Maybe because people just don't see the value of prayer, or they don't. S- they don't see the, the, the power in it. I don't know. They, maybe their prayers haven't been answered. I don't know. Maybe they're just, well, I'm embarrassed to pray out loud. I'm embarrassed to pray out loud. I only pray when I'm alone. Some view prayer as 
a repeating of prayers that they learned as a kid or in the Catholic Church, so that's all they know. And so listen, they, they, they pray these repetitive prayers. And there is a closeness, listen, that God desires of all of us that comes through prayer, but it doesn't come through vain repetition. It comes through sharing your heart. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, he says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Listen, God's not concerned about your many words, your many Hail Marys, your many Our Fathers. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to hear your heart. He wants you to communicate with him. He wants you to be in touch with him. I found this cute little book. You can actually get it on Amazon um, that kind of shatters the misconceptions of prayer. And you can get it for like three to five bucks, and you're going to want to get it after I read you a few of these excerpts because it's cute. It's a compilation of children's prayers to God. And the book is called Children's Letters to God. And I'm just going to read a few of them. Now, I, I had to type them out because, it, you know, in their writing, it's all scribbled. It's a crayon. It's kind of hard to write. And all the words are misspelled and everything. So I had to make it. So, but thank you. Anita says this. Dear God, is it true that my father won't get into heaven if he uses his bowling words in the house? <laughs> Neil says, Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kiss right in church. Is that okay? <laughs> Joanne said, Dear God, I would like to know why all things you said are in red. <laughs> in the Bible. Donnie said, Dear God, is Reverend Joe a friend of yours or do you just know him through business? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, Darla said, Did you really mean to do unto others as they do unto you? Because if you did, I'm going to fix my brother. <laughs> I can relate. Right? My boys can relate with that right now. <laughs> Jeff said, Dear God, it's great that you always get the stars in the right places. I like that. Joyce said, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but I prayed for a puppy. <laughs> Timmy said, Dear God, I wish there was no such thing as sin. I wish there was no such thing as war. Larry said, Dear God, <laughs> Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel wouldn't kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works for my brother. <laughs> Elliot said, Dear God, I think of you sometimes even when I'm not praying. I like that. A little boy named Nan said, Dear God, <laughs> I bet it's very hard for you to love all of everybody in the world. There are only four people in my family, and I can never do it. <laughs> um, Nora said, Dear God, I don't ever feel alone since I found out about you. Oh. A few more. Donna said, Dear God, we read Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said you did it. So I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> Sam said, Dear God, I want to be just like my dad when I get big, but just not with so much hair. <laughs> and lastly, Dear God, I'm doing my best, Frank. Do you think God was saying, Well, no, you got to have the seven steps to enter into my presence and this and that. You got to go pray through this and that. You got to. No. He was hearing the hearts of these children. It's that childlike faith that he wants us to have, right? It's that it's that it's just coming to him. I remember uh, <laughs> when I, Ron and I first got married, I was working for Office Depot. I was a merchandise transportation engineer, which basically means I was a delivery driver. 
and uh, I was I was driving in Vernon, and um, I I go across. I see these railroad tracks. I go across the railroad tracks, and there is no guards that came down, no bells that were you know like a normal thing. All I know is I cross the tracks, and then this train just went. And I'm like, whoa! And I just I thought I was gonna die. And I obviously didn't. I didn't get hit, nothing. I just barely made it across. I pulled over. I was shaken. But I can tell you, at that point in time, I did not walk through the seven steps of praying into the kingdom of God or into the presence of God and do it. I had no time for that. I, I, didn't even, I don't even think I even prayed. I just went, oh, like that. I just freaked because I thought I was going to get nailed by this train. We ought to just simply pray. He breaks down this prayer, or I'm going to break down this prayer, and I'm going to give you guys some insight on, on, on this or through this prayer for our lives because it's very important. And I'm going to do this as quickly as possible. I've, I know people that take the Lord's Prayer and they create it into weak studies. And I'm, I'm just not going to do that today. Okay? But verse 2 says... Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father. I think it's important to notice that this prayer is in plural form. Our Father. He's our Father. He's exclusive to us as His children. Romans 8.15 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. When I was a kid, even till this day, I still look at my dad and I say, Hey, puppy. I call my dad, puppy. How you doing, puppy? Hey, pops. How you doing, dad? You know? Um, that, that, those are endearing terms, Right? In Israel, when you go to Israel, I have been blessed to go twice, you'll see these little Jewish boys running around in their little yarmulkes, and some of them have like the long little squirrely sideburns and everything, and they're chasing after their dads, and what are they saying? Are they saying, Papi, Papi, Papi? No, they're going, Abba, 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 Abba. Abba simply means daddy. That's all it is. When I call my dad Papi, I'm calling him daddy. That's what Hispanics do. So Abba, it simply means daddy. And we have been adopted into the family of God, and we can call daddy, our father, Abba. Sometimes I'll be praying with my wife, and she cries out, Abba. When she was praying, when she was praying, praying intently and praying hard for her mom to be healed, she would pray, Abba, Abba, daddy. Daddy, when was the last time you, you've ever called God Daddy? Have you ever gone to him just like as a child? Daddy, I need help. Dad. I know when I was a kid growing up, there's nothing my dad wouldn't do for me. There's nothing I wouldn't do for my kids. There was this guy that threatened me when I was walking home from elementary school. And I remember my dad went over there with a baseball bat and threatened this guy and said, stay away from my son if you ever say, and I can't repeat what he said, but he, this, these kids left me alone. These kids left me alone. My dad went to bat for me, <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. It was my dad. My dad's done a lot of things. But listen, we have this access to God. When we get into prayer, we get this intimacy uh, this intimate relationship built with God, and it also gives us access to Him, where we can go and ask Him. The Bible says in Hebrews, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace, that you would find mercy and help in a time of need. Come boldly. Come running. I'm amazed at some of the things that my kids ask me for. The expensive things that my kids ask me for. I won't list them because I don't want to embarrass them. But I remember I asked my parents for expensive things too. We do that. We just ask. If you don't ask, you don't receive. Hey, you can ask. You might get it. You might not. I don't know. 
But they have this access to come to me at you know, any time. I don't deny my kids from coming to me. I want them to come to me more. And so just like I want my kids to come to me more, the, can you imagine the Heavenly Father wants you to come to him more? Wants me to come to him more? Because we have this access. He says, hallowed be your name. In other words, holy is your name. God is holy. Although there is a great intimacy and availability there, there is also an equally great reverence that is to be observed in talking to God. He is holy. Remember who you are talking to. You are talking to a holy God. So be reverent before him. Sometimes our prayers can just be like, oh, okay, God, I just pray for this and that. Well, think about who you're talking to. Think about who you're talking to, the reverence that God is allowing you to talk to him. We are to enjoy the intimacy and come boldly into his presence and rest in his arms, but never forget for a minute who it is that we're talking to because we are told in him, the Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. It is him. It says there, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is not getting your will in heaven, it's getting God's will on earth. I've heard that many times. I don't know who said it, but it's the truth. It's not getting my will in heaven. It's getting God's will done here on earth. It's not me arguing with God, trying to persuade him to move things our way. Instead, prayer is an exercise where we are enabled by the Spirit to move ourselves his way. His way. God's will is always perfect for you. There is nothing that you and I could ever dream of that would be better than God's will. His will is perfect. His will is always the best. Think of it this way. When you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, you are asking for God to establish his kingdom in your life. So pray, come, my king, and take your rightful throne in my life. Be present in my heart. Come into my marriage. Come into my relationships. Be the Lord in my family. Be in my business. Be in my workplace. Be in my kids. Take your rightful place in my life, God. I need you. Sit on the throne of my heart. Give us this day our daily bread, verse 3. It's a personal petition. It's okay to pray for your daily needs. We all have them. And God, I believe, desires to meet our needs, but I believe he also uses these needs to draw us to him. Imagine if you just had everything and you didn't need anything. You probably wouldn't go to God. So because we have these needs, it draws us to him. He uses it to draw us to him. Matthew 6, 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you, need, you have need of before you ask him. And so the Lord wants you to take advantage of the fact that he wants to meet with you, and he wants to meet your need. And then moving on, we're almost done. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. A child of God, or as a child of God, we are taught the importance of forgiveness. In fact, Jesus taught the disciples in principle and in parable the importance of forgiveness. Remember Peter, when he asked Jesus, Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody? Should I, give, should I forgive them? Seven times, or 70 times seven? No, I'm sorry. Should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus said, Uh, No, Peter, you need to forgive him 70 times 7. 490 times. In other words, you are to continually forgive them. Why? Because not only are you to continually forgive them, you are to continually forgive them because I continually forgive you. I forgive you. Forgiveness is not a matter of math. (laughs) It's a matter of spirit. It's not a matter of math. People like to put numbers on it. There's a limit to my forgiveness. There's a limit. No, no, you, you cross the line. Three strikes, you're out, buddy. That's it. You're done. 
Not with God. Not with God. The person who says, how many of you guys have heard this? I will never forgive them. Or maybe you've said that. I will never forgive them for what they've done for me or to me. They've crossed the line. This is it. I'm I'm shutting them out of my life. I'm done with them. The person who says that has forgotten the grace of God that has been bestowed on their life. And they are not in the spirit of Jesus. And they're not in that spirit extending forgiveness to those who are seeking it. Let me ask you a question. When you mess up and you blow it, and you go to God and you ask him for forgiveness, that inner part of you that really desires that forgiveness from God, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you, you, you need that forgiveness from God. And so you go to God and you ask him for forgiveness. And what does he do? Does he stomp you into the ground or press you? <laughs> he forgives you. The moment you confess it, he forgives you. We humans, we take that when somebody's asking us for forgiveness and we let them marinate in that. And we let, them, we let them just suffer in that because they want it. And we let them suffer in that. And listen, that is ungodly. And we've all been guilty of that. We need to forgive just as God has forgiven us. We cannot hang on to unforgiveness. Hanging on to unforgiveness and bitterness is like, You drinking the poison, expecting the other person to die, it's not going to happen. You are killing yourself. You're killing yourself. Let it go and let God. For some people, it takes a process to get to that point. Sometimes God just blows you away with something amazing through that person, but you've got to listen. You've got to let it go. You can either get better or get bitter. It's up to you. And I'm going to have to close here. Well, I'll just do this part. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The man who prays, lead us not into temptation, and then goes into, it is a liar before God. God, please don't let me go this way. And then they just go. Lead us not into into temptation is shameful profanity when it comes from the lips of men who resort to places of amusement whose moral tone is bad. That's what Charles Spurgeon said. If we truly pray, lead us not into temptation, it will be lived out in several ways. It will mean that we'll never boast in our own strength. It will mean that we'll never desire trials. It will mean that we'll never go into temptation. It will mean that we'll never lead others into temptation. It just becomes this this crazy cycle. And we'll pick up next week on on prayer. But listen, the thing that I want to just close out with you today is this. Is that we have this incredible access to God 24-7. And He wants us. Does that mean you have to sit down and pray and close your eyes? And No. Pray while you're driving. Pray while you're walking. Pray as you You can pray thinking. You can pray out loud. You can just say it in your mind. Say it in your heart. However... But just do it. Okay, Lord, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to make this decision? So many times we make decisions. Listen, we have to be teachable. I don't care how long you've been doing what for how long. If God doesn't want you to do it, don't do it. Because if you don't listen to God, you're just going to end up in trouble. It may have worked last year, two years, three years before, but that was God's will at that time. What if God has a different will for you this time? 
What if God says, I don't want you to do that this time. I want you to do this. And so take your experience and your knowledge out of the way and your pride and yourself out of the way and walk in obedience by faith to the Lord. And allow God to just do this work in your life. As you trust Him and you look to Him, speak to Him and you talk to Him regularly, let Him be the Lord of your life. In everything that you do. And you will see that you will grow. And you will grow incredibly. Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, that we have this access to you. And Lord... um, I know that not all of us take advantage of it all the time. Perhaps we allow things to come in and distract us. Just like Martha last week. She was distracted with much serving. She was doing a good thing, but yet she was distracted. And so, Lord, I just pray for anybody here that would be distracted. Anybody here that would be discouraged. Anybody here that would be resting on emotions and feelings on, on why to pray and why they're not praying or this and that. But, God, Lord, your word tells us to pray. As a matter of fact, it says to pray without ceasing. And so, Lord, I just ask that, God, you would stir us all up, Lord, to have constant communication with you. Teach us to pray. Teach us, God, to have this burning desire in our hearts to pray. Teach us, God, to have this desire in our lives, Lord, that that is um, absolutely necessary to meet with you. So we need you. And I just want to pray for everybody here. No matter what the need is, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what the burden is, no matter what the concern is, no matter what it is, God, that, Father, you would lift them. That, Father, they would turn their eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. As we keep our eyes on You, Jesus, looking to You, we love You and we praise You. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's close out in a song.